of the stuff we did. So what we did this quarter, in the beginning we started looking at semiconductor materials, right? And we said we could define conduct, uh, conductivity or conductance or resistivity or resistance at two different levels, macroscopic and microscopic. So we looked at the macroscopic level, we saw that you can actually define the resistivity, which is a quantity that's kind of independent of the actual physical dimensions of the material, it's just a property of the material for that. And then we went and said, well, let's look at it and see how it looks at the microscopic level. So what we did, we went and looked at the simplest model for a quantum system, an energy, a bounded system, where you have quantized energy level, which was basically the hydrogen atom. And then we saw that there are different energy levels. We started with those. And we, then we saw that if you bring quite a few atoms together, what happens is that these atoms, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, these energy levels start splitting. And you have more and more energy levels very close to each other. So eventually it turned out the energy bad back. And then we saw with that kind of mentality, when we actually look at the materials, the semiconductor materials are the ones that have multiple bands in general, but there are two bands that are particularly significant for us. What we call, the one we call the valence band. And the edge of that valence band is shown with this energy EV. And there's a conduction band, EC, which is above this and below that. Now, in a semiconductor material, this band is completely at, at zero Kelvin. This band is completely full, and this band is empty, right? Now, as you raise the temperature, what happens is that you read up, release some electrons, because you saw that these electrons in general had some sort of a fermi Dirac distribution, which we approximated with Boltzmann distribution in many cases, and we saw that there would be some hot ones that have enough energy to get released and create an electron, and what's left behind was called a hole, and it behaved like a particle with positive charge. And of course, since the, this cannot move as readily as this one, basically it's a more crowded area, this bubble. This is the bubble and this is the droplet. This one had smaller mobility in general. And, but, and in, in, in a pure semiconductor, these numbers have to be equal. And that was not particularly useful because yeah, it's fine because it becomes temperature dependent thing. It has very strong dependence on temperature. In fact, it's an exponential. If you look at the number of uh, electrons versus temperature, or number of holes in this case, it doesn't matter unless they are the same. So it could be a, a very strong exponential function. Right? Now, then we said, well, we have to manipulate this somehow and be able to control the number of electrons and holes independently if we could, or at least some degree independent create some degree of independence so, so we can at least have a situation where they are not exactly equal at all times. And we saw that if we introduce, for instance, the column 5 atoms into the semiconductor, and the number of these atoms is quite small, you have to keep in mind, right? Because I think about, um, if you're talking about 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16, and even higher, let's say 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 for now, so what is the number of atoms in one mole of silicon. It's the Avogadro's number, right? Which is 6 times 10 to the 23, right? So let's say 10 to the 23. Well, kind of now, we're talking about introducing about 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 atoms out of 10 to the 23. So that would be 1 out of what? 1 out of 10 to the 8. So they're extremely rare, and that's why they don't mess up the crystalline structure. And you can actually go up to 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 21 even and be still at a very small number, have a very few, few of these atoms. And that's in fact why when you go to very short channel devices, very small dimension devices, the doping has to, you have to revisit the way the doping works because you can think about it. You have a channel that's about 100 atoms long, right? Now, if, I, if my doping level is 10 to the 15, how many atoms do I get in that channel? It's one atom 10 to the 8. So pretty much most of the times, actually, I get nothing. And, well, if I follow the, 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 the um, scaling theory more accurately, I have to have a high, much higher doping level. Even if I'm at 10 to 21, I get one out of 100, right? So I, I may have one atom in there. Now imagine that it won't be exactly one atom, sometimes it's maybe two atoms, sometimes it's maybe zero atoms. And that would be a substantial change. From one atom to two atoms, that's 100 percent. You could argue that from one atom to zero atoms, that's infinite percent. Right? Change in properties. So you can expect, and, and you remember, that's one of the things that controls the threshold level. 
So as the devices shrink and become smaller and smaller, the threshold levels are becoming less and less predictable and more and more stochastic. So you have to think about that. Keep that in mind when you design very short channel devices, and that's one of the challenges people have. People actually, there are people who do research on stochastic doping problem, which is the problem I just described. Now, nonetheless, in a typical semiconductor, you introduce these atoms. Let's say you introduce a column five atom, let's say phosphorus or arsenic, and when you introduce that, if you can model it in the energy band diagram picture as these energy levels, very close to the conduction band. Now, the reason I show them as separate energy levels is that they are, once they are ionized, they, they leave behind an ion that's not movable, it's not mobile. Now, in this situation, with a little bit of temperature, because this energy is much smaller than that, as, as you raise the temperature, this electron will be free, so you will free up another electron. However, you don't create a hole. What you create instead is a positively charged ion. So, it would be an arsenic plus, right? It's an arsenic atom or phosphorus atom that has lost a, an electron. So you can increase the number of electrons with respect to the holes. And we saw that they, when you look at this distribution and the thermal generation, you see that it's the product of the two that's constant at, at any temperature. So as you increase the number of electrons, effectively in steady state, and in, in thermal equilibrium, not steady state, in thermal equilibrium, what happens is that you're reducing the number of holes to maintain this relationship. But the more electrons you introduce, the fewer holes you will have automatically. And the reason is that if you just keep increasing the number of electrons without reducing the holes, there will be more electrons and, and they, there will be quite a few holes, so the chance of recombination increases, so they recombine to the level that this condition is held. Now, in that situation, if you look at it versus temperature, what happens is that we saw that this process doesn't take a whole lot of temperature. So what happens is that if you have a donor level, ND, you very quickly get there at a much lower temperature. And you stay there until you get close to this intrinsic generation of carriers. And this was the useful range of the semiconductor material. This is a very good property. Because there is a reasonable temp range of temperatures over which you can maintain your number of carriers, let's say electrons or holes, similarly to four holes, constant. Right? So you can control that. And that's a very nice property. That, that It's just because of this that it's possible to make these kind of things in a reliable fashion. You don't have to worry, when you, make, when you use a transistor, you, you don't specify and say, this is a transistor 2N2222 2 that you can use between 37.5 degrees and 36 degrees, or, or whatever, 38 degrees or something like that. They don't give you a 2 degree Celsius range. And of course, you can, even from this curve, you can tell if you want to make a semiconductor that works at a higher temperature, what you need. What do you need to make a semiconductor that works at higher temperature? If you want to make transistors that work at 200 degrees Celsius. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because you want this to happen at a later point. And the way that happens is that it's an exponential dependence on the band gap energy. So you want a larger band gap for that to happen. Now, the other thing we saw is that you can, of course, generate holes too by creating these energy levels, which are basically column three elements, primarily boron. And you get ionized borons receive an electron and leave behind a hole. So you can create both p-type and n-type type of materials. Uh, so that was the basis for semiconductors. And then we said, OK, well, of course, then these electrons can move around. We saw that there, there were basically different modes of, modes of movement. One was the random thermal movement, which, which is sometimes called diffusion. Uh, which basically, where electrons, because of their thermal energy, move around. And we saw that they move extremely fast. Their speed was very high. Now, there was a second mode of operation, which was the drift, in which, on the contrary, they move extremely slow on the average. But since you have a very large amount of charge, if you think about it, the electronic gas, you calculate the charge of the electronic gas, is quite large. Right? Think about it. If you have your know, electron concentration is 10 to the 16, right, per cubic centimeter. That is that you have 10 to the 16 movable electrons per cubic centimeter. And each one of them carries a charge of what? A charge of uh, 1.6 10 to the minus 19, right? So let's say it's basically 10 to the minus 10 to the 16, 10 to the minus 19. It's 10 to the minus, it's one, 10 to the minus 3 coulombs of charge per cubic centimeter, right? And think about that moving at 1 meter per second. Right? What is the 
current density. Remember, it's a cubic centimeter. So what is it for a cubic meter? That charge density times 12. You have to multiply it by 10 to the 6, right? So each centimeter, is me, each meter is 10 to the 2 centimeters, and it's cubic, so it's 10 to the 6. So you're talking about 10 to the 3 coulombs per cubic meter. And if it moves at 1 meter per hour per second, that corresponds to what? 1 kiloamp of current. Right? So that's basically, you can see there's a lot of charge there. That's why it doesn't need to move that fast to carry a lot of current. The amount of charge is so large that even a slight movement of this electronic gas creates substantial currents. So that was the drift mode. And you saw that in that mode, normally under low electric field, it's the velocity, drift velocity, which is the average velocity on top of the thermal velocity, was proportional to the electric field. And this is in fact a vector relationship. In general, this, and this is of course valid for an isotropic semiconductor. In general, you can have non-isotropic semiconductor where, where this would be a tensor, and it would not necessarily be a line. So you can actually have the electric field, field in one direction, and the movement can happen in this electric field direction. So, but it, it, for our purposes, basically, this is a linear vector relationship. And we saw that that was the drift, and we saw we analyzed that, and we basically based on that, we could come up with the expression for the conductivity of the semiconductor material, right? So we saw that the conductivity of a piece of semiconductor was simply um, mu n q mu n um, uh, q mu n n plus q mu p p, right? That was the total conductance. Of, the semiconductor, uh, of, the, of a piece of semiconductor, or any kind of material in general, that from a microscopic perspective. So we took that and we said, okay, well, we have this kind of semiconductor material, what can we build with it? So the first thing we built is that, well, let's, let's put a p-type and an n-type material together, and we made this diode, so what, basically what we did, we made the p-n junction diode. And in that case, we had basically we had the p-type and the n-type here, and what we saw is that these electric, there's plenty of poles here, and there's plenty of electrons here, they're moving randomly. Thank you. 
potential, we lowered this potential barrier on both sides, and as a result, there will be quite a few more electrons that can move to this side, and quite a few more holes that can move to the other side. And they're not repelled anymore. And basically, the net new current, the, the total current that's carried by, in this case, would be limited, would be determined by this part, right? Because that part was already compensated with the charge created in the division region. So it was only this part that carried some net current for you. And we saw that, of course, this current, this part is proportional to EQ uh, V diode over KT because of the voltage distribution minus one. And the minus one came from this part. You have to compensate for this current that's compensated with the return current from the generation current. And the proportionality called what was we call phi S, and that was the direct current. Now I saw that for most typical situation for VD, since this KT over Q is around 20, it's exact 25.8 millivolts at 300 Kelvin, right? It's quite a small voltage. So for a typical diode voltage, what you have is that this is an E to some large number. And therefore, this one doesn't really matter, so for most practical purposes, you could simply think of this as um, some uh, VD over VT, right? And, of course, that was the current carried by that, and of course, we saw in the reverse case, what happens is that when you increase the barrier height, you pretty much carried no current, and you were limited basically by this current generation current in the depletion region, and what you had to worry about in that case was some sort of a capacitance. So it was a voltage control capacitance, and we'll deal with that more often next quarter when we talk about the dynamics. But it was an addition capacitance associated with this uh, charge layer here. And the way we saw and thought about it is that this addition capacitance is really an incremental capacitor, in the sense that it only it's just behaves like a capacitor to changes. So it's not that you can actually extract this charge. It's not that you can take this Q out, short this, it's not going to take, give you this much charge. That's current. So it's an incremental capacitor, but it's a division capacitor, and we saw that too. So now we took that and we took it one step farther. We'll say, well, this is a nice device if you want to make a rectifier or something. This is just a PN junction dial. But we would like to be ideally able to make a, trend, a device that has three terminals at least, so at least you can use one of the terminals to control the current or the voltage of the other two terminals. And in this case, we said, and of course, we created a, a sandwich of an N region, a, a, an N region, a P region, and an, another N region. And we saw in this case what happens that the energy band diagram looked like that. If you forward bias this one and reverse bias that one. And when you forward bias that one, you actually create a lot of electrons that can cross into the base. And then when you reverse bias the other one, you, you, allow us, you create a large electric field here that will absorb these electrons once they get to the other side. Now, if you just do it this way, we saw that there was a problem. The problem was that there would be an equal number of holes that would be injected back into the emitter if you don't have a structure to collect them. So we said, well, we want to minimize the number of electron holes that are injected back. Because otherwise, you will have to provide a large base current to make up for these lost holes. Now, so the way we dealt with that, we saw that there were several different ways. One was to make this doping level much higher than that doping level. So basically, you start off with so many, so much, so many more electrons than all that even if they move to the left and right with the same probability, since the original number of electrons is much higher, you don't have to worry about the holes. You will get most of the current from the carried by the electrons. So that, that's why you get a much higher doping concentration on the emitter side than the base side. And then we saw that, of course, that that's part of the loss. Of course, there would be still some efficiency associated with this process. And efficiency was the electronic current of the emitter divided by the electronic plus the whole current of the emitter. And that's what we call the emitter injection efficiency. Now, the other thing that we looked at is that, well, although the base is we saw that the base is actually of the opposite type. So once the electrons end up in the base, they are a minority carrier. And since there are a whole lot of majority carriers, right, a lot of holes in this case, there is a very high probability of recombination there. And you don't want to lose these electrons because these are the ones that will carry your charge. So what happened is that we said, well, we want to create this hostile region. If we want to make this hostile region 
as small as short as possible. And the way we get that with that and make it very short was basically by creating by making the base very thin, right? To allow for this electron to pass on per term as much as possible. But nonetheless, there will be certain loss of electrons, right? And you say that's the base transport factor, which is the ratio of the electrons that make it to the collector, but divided by the number of electrons that are injected into the emitter. And we saw that the combination of these two, actually there's a third effect, which is the injection of the holes back into the collector. But that's not too worrisome because this potential value is quite large. So we said, well, it's the combination of these two effects that determines my alpha dc, which is the ratio of the collector current to the emitter current, which would be alpha t times gamma. And we said, well, in a properly designed transistor, this would be very close to 1. And then we saw that, well, if we define it that way, then we can define this other parameter beta, which is alpha over 1 minus alpha. And that parameter was quite large. The, the closer alpha is to 1, the larger it would be. So basically, if alpha is 1, this would become infinity, exactly. Um, so that's a measure of the ratio of the collector current to the base current. Right? It gives you the ratio of those two currents in general. And, that's big. and, and of course, as you can see from this, data should not be constant, although when we treat it as some sort of a constant, it's not exactly constant. It, it changes with quite a few things. It changes with temperature, it changes with other things, it even changes with current. So if you actually look at the prop plot beta versus the current itself, you'll see it's not quite constant. So it's kind of a misleading equation if you write it this way because this is really beta of IC. But for all practical purposes, we say, well, as long as beta is large, we can treat it as a large quantity and we don't need to worry about this, as long as alpha remains close to 1. Now, for instance, can you think of a reason why beta would drop at large currents? Well, look at the total number of uh, electrons injected into 
corresponds to another capacitor in parallel with CJE, so your C pi, the total capacitance for CJE, which is the junction capacitor, the, the uh, depletion capacitance, plus CB, where CB was GM tau f. And we've done this calculation. So just uh, a review of that. Now, and that's, that's an important capacitance we'll talk about extensively in X4 when we actually go and analyze the subjects. Now, so that was our, my bipolar transistor. And then say, well, how do I model it? From a large signal perspective, I saw that I could model this bipolar transistor, let's say an NPN transistor, as a diode, right, and a current source. It's controlled by the current through that diode. So if this current is IE, it's called IF, this is alpha F IF. And this was the emitter, this was the base, uh, this was the base, and this is the collector, right? Now, that's assuming that this junction is forward biased and this junction is reverse biased. Now, in general, you have two of these. You have a reverse transistor, which is not a great transistor, but nonetheless, it's there. And that can be modeled by another diode and another current source. Here is the alpha R, IR, and this is IR. And this is what we call the, call the evers mall model. Now, you can see that transistor is something more than just two back-to-back -back diodes. Because of this phenomenon of passing through the base and the base, it's basically this, this current source, which is the useful part of the transistor. Everything else is parasitic. The part that we usually use is that current source, and everything else is our necessary evils or things we can't get rid of. Ideally, I would have liked to see no diode here, no diode there, no current there. I wanted to have an ideal current, voltage control current source or current control current source, like it could happen. But I have to deal with this as a part of my problem. So now we saw that actually you can take this model and, so this is a large signal model. This, is a, this describes the transistor in, in, in its entirety in all different regions of operation. Forward active region, saturation, turn off, reverse active, all of that. But now, one of the things we saw is that well, for analysis, and this is a nonlinear model, so if I wanted to analyze the transistor, I prefer to linearize it around an operation point. And that was the basis for the small signal model for this. And you saw that you could have a T model in the forward active region that looked like that. So this is the T model. So this was alpha RM. This is alpha IE. This is current. This current is IE. This is the base collector and the emitter. So that was the basic transistor model. And we also saw that the collector current is actually a function of the collector voltage itself because of the base width modulation or the early effect. And that early effect was captured as an RO, 
power coming from? Where's that energy coming from? Why is that? 
Why is it that we don't, although, well, I said it's just the, the thermal velocity here and all that, uh, is, the thermal velocity is much higher than the drift velocity, right? Why is it that they don't see that three orders, four orders of magnitude strength difference between them? There must be something else at play here that works for this guy, right? Thank you. 
So for a MOS, for a bipolar transistor, GMR will happen to be VA over VT. This is KT over Q. So the early voltage over the KT over Q. That ratio was the maximum gain you could get out of a basic common error stage. Right? Maximum intrinsic gain. And for MOSFET, which was basically a little bit more complicated, but right? it didn't have the right expression for GM and IO, and we saw that actually for GM, it's 2 mu n c ox w over l i d. And RO was I, uh, L over ID DXD DVDS. That's one. So what you saw is that you have a bunch of constants, right? Times square root of W times L. Well, let's just keep the constants. Um, 2 mu n C ox W L divided by ID and then times dxd, dvds, minus 1. Now, interestingly, if you look at this equation, you see, well, you, the larger you make your device, the more gain you get, the more fundamental intrinsic gain, the higher that would be. But it comes at the price of the capacitance, because we saw also the capacitance of the MOSFET, the gauge capacitance was 2 thirds C ox W L times L. So it comes lower. That's one thing. Of course, if you have better mobility and all those things, that, that always help. If you make, if you want to get, if you make your oxide thinner and thinner, it would have more higher intrinsic gain. But of course, that there would be a limit. One limit that we are arriving at very quickly is the number of atoms, the thickness of an atom. So we are right now the gate oxide is about something like five atoms thick. We also have to process technology, so we can't make it less than one atom. Right? Can we get two thirds of an atom here? Um, so, now here, uh, so that, that's the, 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 those are all good and fine. The part that was a little bit confusing was this ID business, right? So, because you had the ID in the denominator, and you said, well, the maximum intrinsic gain according to this equation seems to go to infinity when ID goes to zero. And we know that's not quite the case because as ID becomes smaller and smaller, the VGS minus VT becomes smaller and smaller, the gate overdrive. And as a result, what you actually get is that you, you go into the sub threshold region. Now, in the subthreshold region, we saw that the transistor behaves more like an exponential behavior. And the reason is that this band, energy band diagram are not low enough. So basically, you have something like this, and then you have, you're limited by the number of electrons that you have at your disposal. So you are more in a situation that, that it looks like a bipolar transistor. So the dependence of the drain current on the gate voltage becomes an exponential dependence as opposed to a quadratic one. So it starts behaving more like a bipolar transistor. And if you have an exponential dependence, then GM dependence on the current would be something like IC over VT. Right? So it's more like a bipolar. And if GM is IC over VT, or ID over VT in this case, then ID cancels ID. So instead of going to infinity, it plateaus at some point. So if you look at the maximum intrinsic gain, based on this equation, if you don't think about the subthreshold, it goes to infinity, but it plateaus at the level determined by that. So that's also another lesson from, to be learned. I mean, if you want to really get the highest gain out of the transistor, MOSFET, you want to operate in some pressure. It will not be able to drive a lot of current, so it will become very slow. But sometimes you don't care about speed. There are certain applications where you don't care about speed. You just want something that has very high gain and low frequency, some precision applications, right? Or some very low power applications. If you are trying to run a circuit that runs off of a scavenger, scavenger energy, right? Sometimes a lot of app for a lot of kind of sensor applications, what you want is that you don't want your circuit to be uh, running off of a battery. You don't want to have a battery. So what you do, you make some circuit that actually picks up the electromagnetic energy or the mo move motion, kind of the mechanical energy of the shaking and movements and all those things, and turns that into something a little bit of electrical energy and stores it on some sort of capacitor. And you, have, you are required to make circuits that run off of, a, off of that at a one microamp kind of current, or even less, 100 nanometers. And you can make sense that people make all sorts of circuits, right? The run of those. They won't be very fast, but they work. So, one simple example, of course, are these watches, right? I'm sure you've seen these watches that don't have a battery. That's one example. Of course, you can lose a lot, quite a lot. But even in that case, 
Or you can, actually there's a lot of discussion about picking up energy, electro, there's a lot of electromagnetic energy in the air. Here, if you actually have a long enough wire, you are close enough to Mount Wilson, if you have a long enough piece of wire, I can turn on a little light bulb. Yeah. Scared, right? The good thing is that we are not very conductive. But that's just uh, what we're worried about. So we don't need to. But actually, if you go up the top of Mount Van Wilson, I don't know how many of you have gone up there. You can drive up, it's beautiful actually. They're called pipe and But the big antennas, there's a fence around them, right? So you can't get closer beyond a certain point. It's primarily for your own safety. <laughs> really? If, if you take a piece of wire about this long and a light bulb, there, just make a dipole antenna. Go up there, take a little small light bulb, take it there, you can turn it off. So, there's a lot of energy out there, so the, that, that's the thing. So, scavenging energy from these sources could be interesting and useful, right? I mean, you don't want to be changing batteries every day. You know? Anyway, so, soft threshold, lowest current consumption, highest gain, extremely slow. Okay. So that was the basic intrinsic of the gain of the device and all that. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Do you want to take a need to take a break now and continue later, or do you want to go and then you can have pizza? They are supposed to deliver it at eleven thirty, but they are never on time, so they may deliver it at twelve. Right. What do you want to take? Break now or make your mind? How many people want to take a break now? Okay. How many people want to continue? <laughs> two to one. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's a close connection. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask for a recount. <laughs>